Hello, it is a pleasure to welcome you all here in Amsterdam, and it is my great pleasure to also welcome our first invited speaker, which is uh, David Mackay. Uh, many of you know David because he uh, was once a member of his community. Uh, now he is, uh, since 2013, uh, in the position of Regius Professor of Engineering at uh, uh, Cambridge University. But his career started long ago. It started actually with winning a first prize uh, at the Physics Olympiad in Yugoslavia. Then he won prediction competitions. Um, he was, along with uh, Radford Neal, one of the people who promoted and made it practical and made it uh, um, common to use Bayesian networks, uh, no, to use Bayesian uh, prediction and Bayesian analysis in large complex systems. Um, he then contributed to information theory, uh, along with a group of people that included uh, French researchers Berlou and Gravieux, and again Red Cornille, and uh, uh, he rediscovered the Gallagher codes, which were invented first before he was born. Uh, and this discovery uh, truly revolutionized uh, the field of information theory. Um, at uh, a conference in information theory, it was actually uh, stated that um, they solved the main problem, the fundamental problem in, uh, in the field of information theory. And it is no small feat to actually solve the fundamental problem of a field that you're not a member of. This is actually a <coughs> thing for everybody who works inside the field and never looks outside. This is not true for David, who actually took five years. Uh, from 2009 to 2014, to work as the chief, uh, uh, I hope to get this right, chief scientific advisor uh, for the Department of Energy and Climate Change of the uh, United Kingdom. And uh, in this position, he actually advised the government on policies for uh, conserving energy. Uh, one of his uh, achievements is a, um, an energy calculator that was adopted by the government in 20, other co 20 countries, including Britain. But about this, I will let David tell you more. So please help me welcome him. Thank you. Thank you. Should I put this microphone on? Is that a good idea? Yes. Thank you very much. It's muted. Okay. I've switched off mute. Is that better? Yes, it is. So, climate change action. You may have noticed in the news about a month ago uh, that there was a huge breakthrough and the G7 leaders agreed to phase out fossil fuels and solve climate change. Again. <laughs> and. So we hear a lot of good news stories, a lot of excitement, a lot of hype, um, and a lot of argument as well about what climate change action should, should look like. Um, and I'd like to bring some back of envelope calculations, some simple laws of physics to help people understand what climate change action uh, would actually look like and how difficult it is. But I'll start by taking this image and I've put it into the Google speech um, that lip reading, automated lip reading, to find out what Angela Merkel is saying. And she is saying this to, to Barack Obama, I think. Uh, she's saying, if we continued with the European policy, which is to replace oil for transport by biofuels, and if we grew the biofuels on the verge of the road, the strip of grass alongside the road, how wide would the verge need to be? How wide would that strip, that biofuel plantation along the edge of the road need to be? Okay, so let's uh, answer her question for her. She's a physicist, I believe, so she, she could probably answer it herself, but let's just replicate the calculation. We'll do it on a back of envelope. We'll just make up some numbers and get an answer. Uh, I love these sort of calculations because they're quick to do and uh, they make you say, hmm, so what should we do? Let's say that we've got one lane of cars and they're perpetually going along on, uh, on this road at 60 miles per hour. And we need a fuel efficiency, so let's take the average fuel efficiency of new cars in Europe, which is 30 miles per gallon. These are imperial gallons, which are a bit bigger than US gallons. Then we need a biofuel plantation productivity, and you have to look that up on Wikipedia. 1,200 litres of biofuel per hectare per year is typical for 
biofuels grown in Northern Europe. And then you need a spacing between the cars, let's say they're 80 meters apart. And that's all we need. We don't need to specify the length of the road because the longer the road, the more cars there are and the longer the biofuel plantation is. So we've got these four numbers. We take the first number and we divide by the other three. Take care with units and you get an answer, a length, which is the width of the biofuel plantation, namely eight kilometers. So I love this sort of calculation because it makes you say, hmm, maybe this European policy for getting off fossil fuels isn't quite the full story of how to actually solve the energy consumption of transport. So, I got a bit angry about the quality of the public discussion of uh, energy options about 10 years ago, and I decided first to write a, a web page, um, and then eventually a book, and I wrote a book full of back of envelope calculations <coughs> to help people understand how to make energy plans that add up. And this book's available free online. I didn't write the uh, book to make money, nor did I write the book in order to be a senior civil servant in the UK government, but sometimes these things happen. So I've just done my five years in government. The book, Being Free Online, has been translated for free by lots of volunteers into other languages as well. So if you have a preferred language, you'll probably find a translation on, on the website uh, for you. I want to start my talk with a tiny bit of climate science because not everyone knows uh, uh, the most important message about climate science, uh, which in my view is this graph here, uh, which is from the summary from the fifth assessment report of the IPCC. The little inset figure here is showing possible emission rates of CO2. The black line shows the history, the emissions rate has been going up. Uh, since the Industrial Revolution. And then in the future, we have a choice. It could continue going up. Uh, this might be worse than business, in business as usual in red. Or it could level out in some way or fall a little bit. Or it could fall to zero or even go a little bit negative as shown in blue. This is the range of possibilities open to, to humanity. And the main figure shows the result of emissions. And the crucial message is that it's cumulative emissions that matter. The vertical axis is showing climate change summarized by a single number, namely global, global average temperature increase relative to pre-industrial. That's a very simple summary for a very complicated thing. The climate is a, a very complex, chaotic system. So having said that, what's the message of this graph? Well, the message is that climate change is proportional to cumulative emissions. The slope of this line here is actually quite uncertain. The pink sausage shows the uncertainty of the climate sensitivity, which is still enormous. This is the, the most important uh, uncertain parameter. Sorry, you can't see it. Oh, can you, the, the pink sausage it goes from here to here on, on this screen. So there's lots of uncertainty about the climate sensitivity, but whatever the climate sensitivity is, all the climate models agree that there is a linear relationship between temperature change and cumulative emissions. And that means if you want to stop climate change, you have to reduce the emissions rate to zero. And that's a really inconvenient truth. So here's the first two reasons climate change action is difficult. First, your emissions rate has to drop to zero, not let's stop emissions increasing, not let's have a 50% reduction in emissions. Those would be really easy things to do. We've got to reduce emissions 100%, or maybe even make them negative, um, which I'll talk about later. So that's, that's bad news. And another piece of bad news is that if you care about this two degree target that people have invented here, and if you accept the central value of this uncertain climate sensitivity, then you've only got half of your budget left before we've reached this two degree level that some people have uh, declared is the point we should not go beyond. So there isn't very long left um, to, to deal with, with climate change, if that is your goal. So everyone's getting very emotional, um, and I think in addition to emotions, which are important, we need some facts. So I'd like to tell you a little bit of energy arithmetic, and my approach in my book 
was to do everything per person to avoid having answers that come in thousands, millions, billions, and trillions. Because most people don't actually know the difference between a thousand, a million, a billion, and a trillion, even though they are actually slightly different. They just sound, they sound the same. And so people can do all sorts of misleading stuff about how many millions of homes something will power. Um, so my approach is to do things per person and to measure energy in kilowatt hours, which is what your electricity bill and possibly your, your other energy bills might be measured in. And I'll measure powers in kilowatt hours per day per person. Physicists and engineers might object, hang on, why aren't you using a sensible SI unit like the watt or the kilowatt to measure power? And the answer is, well, people don't understand watts and kilowatts. If you say the average European has a, a power consumption, energy in all forms, of five kilowatts, lots of people will say, is that five kilowatts per month or per year? They don't understand that the kilowatt has already got the per unit time built in. So that's why I deliberately chose a unit that, it, it, yes, it's a bit ugly, but it, it has the per time there. So people understand that you're talking about a rate of using, using energy. Another reason for not using watts or kilowatts is watts are too small, you end up with answers that are a bit too big to remember, and kilowatts are, uh, are too small, you end up having to use decimal points, which is annoying. So, those are my chosen units, and here's some examples of everyday things that come in small numbers of uh, kilowatt hours for typical people. If you have one standard light bulb and you keep it on for 24 hours, you use one kilowatt hour of electricity. If you eat food, the chemical energy in the food you eat amounts to about three kilowatt hours per day. If you take a hot bath, there's about five kilowatt hours of thermal energy in your bath. If you take a litre of petrol and set fire to it, you dissipate 10 kilowatt hours of chemical energy. And if you have a Coke habit and you drink Coke and you chuck the cans away, the embodied energy to make the aluminium in the can that you chucked away is about two thirds of a kilowatt hour for a single can. Okay, so uh, let me give you just a few more examples. If you drive a car, and not everyone does, but if you do drive a typical average European car 100 kilometers per day, then you're using 80 kilowatt hours per day for the car. If you have a typical house in North America or Britain, you're probably using about 80 kilowatt hours per day on average to run everything in the house and maybe an additional three kilowatt hours per day of primary energy to operate the cat. If you fly, and most of us do, um, you use a hell of a lot of energy on the day when you're flying. Let's spread that out over the year and let's say, just for the sake of argument, that you do one international trip, London to Los Angeles return one per year. Spread that energy out over the year. On average, you're using 26 kilowatt hours per day to have that one seat on the 747. And finally, uh, here is a, a, a very difficult to discern, evil uh, a black object that people talk about. The mayor of London had an, uh, a planet repairs campaign, and the planet repairs campaign had about seven posters around London. Uh, for different things you could do to do your bit. And this one said, if every London household unplugged their mobile phone chargers when not in use, we could save 31,000 tonnes of CO2 and 7.7 .7 million pounds per year. Thousands, millions, clearly very, very important. Well, let's just do a tiny calculation. Seven million people live in London, so if you're saving seven million pounds per year, that's one pound per year per person. Now, is that therefore the number one thing or the number seven thing you should have on your posters. Let's check it another way. Uh, let's see how closely related the phone charger is to that radar. The energy saved, if you commit this feat of energy saving, you switch off the phone charger for a whole day. The energy saved by that energy conservation is the same as the energy used by driving an average car for one second. Both of those are equal to 0 0.01 kilowatt hours. I'm not saying don't switch off the charger. I'm saying be aware of the numbers. Think about the whole system. So just to remind you, the last four numbers I've shown you are here all on the same, the same scale. The car, the house, the jet lights, and the phone charger. Okay. Now, in my introduction, I told you about the uh, biofuel plantation, um, and you'll realize that uh, area is going to matter. Here's the, the total energy consumption uh, of a typical European person, a, a UK or a German citizen. It's using about 125 kilowatt hours per day which is roughly a third going into transport, heating, and electricity. And we need to talk about areas, because one of the messages in many countries at the moment is, oh yes, let's solve climate change, we, we can do it with efficiency and renewables. 
well, let's have a think about renewables, and let's have a think about land area. So, we need to talk about population densities, uh, which I'll measure in square meters per person, uh, or people per square kilometer, to I'll put it the other way up. And we need powers per unit area, and I'll measure those in the SI unit, in watts per square meter. The UK, uh, as a fairly typical European country, has 250 people per square kilometer. And now I'll make a map of the world for you. Here's a map of the world where the UK is there and Germany's next door. And the horizontal axis is population density. And so we're at 250 people per square kilometer. And the vertical axis is energy consumption per person. And we're up at 125. Both of these scales are <coughs> logarithmic scales. And as you go from one uh, pretty much invisible gray line on this screen here to this gray line here, you've gone up by a factor of 10 in population density. And similarly, there are almost invisible gray lines here and here for a factor of 10 increase in per capita consumption. So you can see a huge diversity of population densities and energy consumptions. Uh, and the UK and Germany and Japan are all a bit atypical up in the top right of the diagram. But we're not that atypical, because if you add little lines to show progress, here are 15 years of progress for Portugal in blue, and China, and South Korea, and Bangladesh, and Brazil, and Sudan. And you can see many countries are moving up and to the right. So this slightly atypical top right corner is perhaps where many countries are going to be uh, in uh, another few decades' time. Um, another thing to bear in mind is while the world average um, in this diagram might be about here, actually about 80% of the world's population is above average. Let me make this precise uh, by talking about power consumption per unit area. I've added some lines with a slope of minus one. There's one here, which is the 0.1 watts per square meter line. What's going on here? If you take the energy consumption per person of a region, and if you multiply that by the population density of that region, the product of those two numbers is the power consumption per unit area. Okay? And so all countries that are lying on this line here, they're all using 0.1 watts per square meter in different ways, Saudi Arabia or India in 1990, both using 0.1 watts per square meter. And that is the world average. If you take total power consumption of humanity and divide it by total land area, you get 0.1 watts per square meter. But 80% of the world's population is above average uh, because if you uh, check how many people actually lie above that line, the answer is 80%. It's just like buses. When you get on a bus, you complain to the bus company, all oh, the buses seem to be crowded because whenever I am on a bus, it's crowded. And the bus company responds, no, 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 the majority of buses are empty. And you're both right because all the people are on the crowded buses. <laughs> okay? So. What can we do with this uh, map of the world? Well, we can express renewables in the same unit. So let's now take this map and shrink it down a little bit. And let's add lines for the power per unit area of renewables. Here's the power per unit area of typical energy crops. Uh, these are the best energy crops you can uh, grow in the Northern Hemisphere, pretty much half a watt per square meter. And if you're very good at maths, and you remember that the UK and Germany are here at 1.25 watts per square meter, you'll realize that 1.25 is bigger than 0.5, which tells you that even if you covered the whole of the UK and Germany completely with energy crops, you couldn't power their current energy consumption from that. You'd need two and a half UKs and Germanys to provide enough energy from energy crops. And uh, yet we're in the strange situation of having renewable targets, and many European countries are using increasing amounts of, of energy crops to meet those, those targets. Is that a good idea? Well, let's keep it on the table as one of our options. What about wind power? Wind farms deliver about 2.5 watts per square meter of wind farm area. And I've got uh, data to back up um, all these assertions I'm, I'm making. So what does that mean? Well, 2.5 watts per square meter is twice 1.25 watts per square meter. So if you literally wanted to completely provide all of the UK's or Germany's primary energy consumption from wind farms alone, they would need to be half the area of the UK or Germany. Um, and what about solar? Well, people often say how the power of the sun hitting the earth is 10,000 times bigger than something or other. 
Um, so it all sounds very impressive, but the, the raw power of desert sunshine at the equator at midday is 1,000 watts per square meter. But it's not midday all the time. It's midday about one quarter of the time, and the average power of desert sunshine is 250 watts per square meter. That's before you convert it into anything useful. And the real efficiency of conversion systems is, is about uh, 10 or 20 percent. And you need to account for the gaps, uh, the land gaps, uh, um, between your collecting systems. Uh, and in reality, what you get down to is more like 5 or 10 watts per square meter from solar park. So this is the power per unit panel area of a solar panel system in the UK. It's delivering on average 20 watts per square meter. It delivers 10 times more in the summer than in the, the winter. Um, that's some, something to bear in mind if you're serious about using solar for lots of stuff. Uh, it is very intermittent. 20 watts per square meter of panel area. Now what if you leap off the roof and adopt the traditional Bavarian farming method where you cover the countryside with solar panels? Well, you get about 5 watts per square meter of land area. Um, and in a sensible country, uh, with, for solar panels, namely somewhere more sunny, you get about 10 watts per square meter. And again, I've got data to back up these assertions. Here's a uh, Vermont uh, solar farm delivering 3.8 watts per square meter. Uh, this is all real data because they actually put their data online, unlike most of these um, organizations. And here's lots more data from solar parks all around the world showing that in ridiculous locations like Britain and the UK, where you shouldn't be putting solar farms, you get about 5 watts per square meter, and in more sensible locations, you get about 10 watts per square meter of land area. Okay, what does that mean? It means if you, on average, wanted to get Germany's power consumption today from solar panels alone, they would need to occupy 25% of the area of Germany. Uh, if you live in a country that has a lower population density, you might say, oh, well, that's all fine. Well, do think carefully about that. If, if you have another country that has the same population as Germany, but a much larger uh, area, then to provide the same amount of power from solar panels that would have required a quarter of a Germany of solar panels in Germany, well, you're still going to need roughly a quarter of a Germany of panels in your own country. So it's still a very big building project, even if you happen to live in a low population density country like uh, Australia or Canada. An option that uh, countries like the UK and Germany can go for, if they start saying, hang on, these renewables, uh, we don't really want them in our backyard, do we, because they're a bit intrusive. An option is to go and invade another country and steal their energy from them. Sorry, did I say invade another country for energy? We wouldn't do such a thing, would we? No, I meant politely talk to another country and, and have a, a, a happy agreement with them to uh, have a partnership. Um, so you could have a partnership with a country that has desert and make solar power from their deserts. And what would you get from those? Well, real solar uh, systems um, using concentrating solar power in deserts give you about 14 watts per square meter of land area, or 10 watts per square meter, or 5 watts per square meter. Incidentally, this fantastic German-funded Spanish uh, system uh, can generate solar power at night as well as in the day because it stores molten salt in these huge tanks here. So that's a fantastic piece of engineering. <coughs> Uh, and it does deliver about 10 watts per square meter, which is the same as the photovoltaic parks I was talking about earlier. Okay, so much as I love them, all renewables are diffuse. They have a small power per unit area. And we could look at other options as well. If we're saying we want climate change action, maybe as well as renewables, we should look at other options like nuclear power. And by this particular metric of power per unit area, Nuclear turns out much better. Here's a one kilometer square on a map, and it's got a one gigawatt power station inside it. Uh, so that's a thousand watts per square meter. So nuclear is less intrusive in the landscape. Um, but nuclear uh, obviously has other popularity uh, problems, and power per unit area is not the only metric that society cares about, and that's fair enough. Uh, but people shouldn't say, oh yes, forget nuclear, because there are popularity problems for every technology. Here is a photograph of a consultation exercise in full swing in the little town of Pennycook, just south of Edinburgh, and you can see the children of Pennycook celebrating the burning of the effigy of the windmill. Because if there's one thing that British people are good at, it's saying no. And I think this is a, a fairly global uh, tendency that everything gets opposed. 
So I strongly urge any country that's trying to take climate change action to keep all the energy options on the table until you've actually got a plan that adds up. And the way I like to describe this is in terms of levers. You've got levers you can push on, and on the supply side, those levers include renewables in your own backyard, bioenergy, windmills, so forth. Invading other countries, sorry, I said it again, we don't invade other countries for their energy. Uh, it, other people's renewables, um, and nuclear power, and there are other low carbon options like carbon capture and storage, which are important to keep on the table too. And if anyone says, oh, I definitely don't like one of those levers, well, you have to realize your energy's got to come from somewhere, and you're going to have to push harder on some other levers. And there aren't just supply side levers, there are demand side levers as well. So people often say, oh yes, we'll use energy efficiency to, to, to make it all uh, easier. And yes, we should discuss those levers too. So we can make transport more efficient, heating and insulation, we can get people to change the way they use energy by being smarter. Uh, let me just walk you through some examples. So the laws of physics say you can reduce the energy consumption of transport, in these ways, yes. Small frontal area, small weight per person, go slowly, go steadily. This is how to reduce air resistance, braking losses, and rolling resistance. And finally, convert energy efficiently between different forms, because standard petrol and diesel engines are only 25% efficient at turning chemical energy into oomph. So how can we do all of those things? Well, here's a standard single-person vehicle in London, which uses 80 kilowatt hours per 100 person kilometers. Can we make a vehicle that's 100 times as efficient? Well, yes, almost. Here's a good example. It's the bicycle, which is powered by biofuel, incidentally. Extra Weetabix in the morning. And it uses only one kilowatt hour per 100 person kilometers. And in between those uh, extreme options are a bunch of other options, like public transport in boxes that go extremely fast with lots of people in them, or individual transport in tiny boxes that go at just 15 miles per hour but don't require the occupant of the tank to actually pedal. They can use petrol uh, instead and get almost the same efficiency as the, uh, as the bicycle <coughs> in um, a vehicle that comfortably accommodates one teenager. Um, and there's a few other options like electric vehicles. An electric vehicle, <coughs> instead of having a 25% efficiency of turning chemical energy into oomph, are about 90% efficient of turning chemical energy in the battery into oomph at, at the wheels. So electric vehicles like the Tesla uh, have a much smaller energy consumption measured at the, the socket. And light weighting is a really good idea, so lightweight electric vehicles like this motorbike. What's the efficiency of turning the energy into the Ah, what about getting the energy into the battery? Yes, so if your power station is only 25% efficient at making electricity for your battery, then you haven't really gained anything and you're still using fossil fuels at your... But we can change the whole system. We can make electricity from other sources that aren't inefficient fossil fuel power stations. Okay, so it's measured at the socket, yes. And we need to think about the whole system, yes, and keep track of efficiency. But for me, the fair way to compare chemical energy and electricity here is measured at, at the socket when you, when you plug the, the chemical energy in. And then we need to say, where does that come from? Because in the future, if we're wanting to take climate change action, and if we want to still use liquid fuels, then we'll have to synthesize those liquid fuels. And so at the moment, the assumption, oh yes, liquid fuels are sort of free and we can get them with 100% efficiency, that assumption is no longer going to be true. And actually synthesizing chemical fuels from electricity might have an efficiency of 33% or so. so Efficiencies are going to, going to change. All right, good question. Do feel free to interrupt if I say anything that is, is not clear. So we've got uh, transport levers. We've also got heating and insulation levers. If you live in a, a coldish country like the UK, um, in a crappy house, this is my crappy house in Cambridge, with the Ferrari outside, uh, you are losing heat and you need power to make up that heat loss. And the heat loss is proportional to the leakiness of the building and the average temperature difference between the inside and the outside. The power required to make up for the heat loss is the heat loss divided by the efficiency of your heat creation system. And so you can reduce the power requirement by attacking any of the three colored terms on the right hand side. You can reduce the temperature difference with an amazing technology called the thermostat. You grasp it and rotate it to the left and your energy consumption goes down. Some people call it a lifestyle change, but I've tried it and it works. Um, you can reduce the leakiness of the building by getting the fluff men in to put fluff in the walls, fluff in the roof, and maybe a new front door. Those sort of changes give you perhaps a 25% improvement in the leakiness. 
if you go the German way and get an insulating blanket put around the outside of the building as well, uh, then you can get a further reduction in the leakiness of crappy old buildings. And finally, the efficiency of the, the heating system. Standard heating is done with uh, burning gas in the UK and in many other countries. You burn natural gas with an efficiency of about 90%. And that's actually a very, very poor efficiency. 90% sounds good, but it's lousy because what you're doing is taking high-grade chemical energy and turning it into low-grade heat. And if you've studied physical chemistry or thermodynamics, you'll know that that's a very bad exchange rate and you can do much better. So here's a heat pump, which is a back to front refrigerator, which allows you to take just one unit of high grade energy in the form of electricity, and then you can deliver about four units of low grade heat into uh, the, the house by pumping heat from the environment at uh, ambient temperature into the house. So you can have an efficiency of 300 or 400% with, with heat pumps. Okay, so there's some more levers. And the final lever I want to mention on the demand side is the read your meters lever. I was writing a book on sustainable energy, and a friend said to me, how much energy do you use at home? And I was embarrassed that I didn't actually know. I didn't know my own energy consumption. And I started reading my meters on a weekly basis, and I started doing experiments. And those experiments actually changed my life. So reading my meter and engaging with my meter got me to, to try things. So I tried tinkering with the thermostat and using the thermostat in a different way. And here's what happened to my gas consumption. It used to be 40 kilowatt hours per day on average, and it dropped down to 13 kilowatt hours per day, thanks to a different relationship with the thermostat. So instead of having a thermostat at a constant level uh, all the time uh, at a particular time of day, I had it at a lower temperature and only turned it up if I was actually feeling cold. And you'll be amazed how much your own physiology can change. The, the, te the target temperature that you'd like your surroundings to be at varies massively, and you can take advantage of that variation and get easily 50% savings. You can also switch off uh, a load of ele electric devices that are left on all the time, things like cable modems, stereos left on all the time, DVD players left on all the time, and switching all of those off, I, I found in my house, saved me 45 watts, which is one kilowatt hour per day, which is a saving of 45 pounds per year, which I can spend on another holiday in Lanzarote. Okay, so we've got a whole load of levers, and they interact with each other, and we need to make a plan that adds up. And if anyone doesn't like one of these levers, if they say, oh, I can't turn my thermostat down, fair enough, you need more nuclear power or more renewables in someone's backyard. And an important thing to emphasize for people who are really serious about making a plan that works is the plan needs to add up every month, every day, and every hour. So if you're using a piece of supply that is intermittent, you've got to somehow figure out how to deal with that intermittency. And if you have demand that is intermittent, you need to figure out how you're going to store energy to be able to track that demand as well. And the intermittency of heat demand in the UK uh, is uh, very significant, shown by this red line, and the intermittency of electricity demand at the moment is shown here on the same scale. And then this graph, which I'm sure you can't see, this shows on the same scale the intermittency of wind power if the UK had as much wind power as Germany has currently got. So there are intermittency issues so to summarize what I've said so far, why is climate change action difficult? Well, I think many people, the general public and policymakers, are unaware of the scale of action required to decarbonize the energy system. And uh, unfortunately, they've been mis misled by a lot of myths because there are people who have a self-interest in trying to persuade people that a particular solution is going to be wonderful. And so they'll sell you micro turbines to put on your roof as if this makes any difference. This is incidentally the roof of the Prime Minister of the UK, David Cameron. So to try and help with this, I wrote the book that I mentioned, and then when I worked for the government, a team in the government department led the creation of uh, a tool called the 2050 Calculator for the UK, which is an energy and emissions calculator, which looks like this, and it allows you to play dictator of Britain and you can just decide, okay, we will have more public transport, we'll have more electric vehicles, we're going to make aviation more efficient, and we'll get people to turn down their thermostats at home by making smarter thermostats that turn down a thermostat 
when people uh, don't mind. And look how big an effect that has. Uh, these are graphs of energy demand, energy supply, and emissions. The black line here, the target, the UK's legal target for 2050 is to reduce emissions down by 80% so this black dot. Okay, and we can insulate homes, and we can switch over to heat pumps, and we can make industry grow a bit less and make it more green and efficient, and we can have heat pumps in the commercial sector, and so forth. So the, here's the demand levers, and here are supply levers. Let's have a fourfold increase in nuclear power. Don't like that? Okay, switch it off again. Um, it, off, offshore wind. Have uh, huge amounts of offshore wind. Let's just show you with a little one pager. Every one of these levers, we're trying to be as clear as possible what the lever does. So we have a little story describing what level one, two, three, four for this lever means. And country comparisons. This is the total wind in Germany in orange and total wind in Spain. And then this is what our lever does for offshore wind in the UK at levels two, three, and four. So you can have literally an Apollo program's worth of offshore wind if you want. Um, Okay, let's put back in the fourfold increase in nuclear, and let's have carbon capture storage. And you can see, if we do all of those things, then this black line is starting to get close to the target. What else can you do? You can import bioenergy from other people's countries, or you can grow bioenergy in your own country. That's helping us get a bit closer. Um, geoengineering, you can switch on the vacuum cleaners that suck CO2 out of the air and bury it in the ground. And if you do a little bit of that, we've pretty much got the target just about, and if we do a hell of a lot of it, then we can actually surpass the UK's legal target. And this tool has transformed the public discussion of, of energy and emission options in the UK. Because now anyone can have their opinion, but it has to add up. And this tool was created as an open source activity involving over 100 experts and stakeholders, including people like Friends of the Earth, so that it has got very wide buy-in. And the Secretary of State for Energy said he thinks this project was the best value for money that the department has spent on climate change. Uh, its influence on social acceptance uh, can be seen by looking at the pathways that people have suggested. So anyone can propose a pathway. The government has several that it has proposed. And here's the Friends of the Earth pathway. And I think if you were to ask pretty much any green group in almost any country in the world, what do you think of carbon capture and storage? I think they would say, nein, stop das CO2 Endlager, and CO2 Bombe, and so forth. And they would say, take action, stop it now, citizens against sequestration, because they don't like messing with Mother Nature and burying CO2 in the ground. But what the Friends of the Earth say in their pathway, which is there in black and white, on this open website, here's the Friends of the Earth pathway, they've got geoengineering at level four. They are burying 110 million tons of CO2 in Mother Earth, using chemical processes to suck it out of the air and bury it in the ground. And CCS power stations, this corresponds to taking 70% of the power stations in the UK that currently burn coal and gas, converting them so that they capture CO2 at the chimney and burying that CO2 in the ground. So we have a very influential green group here that is explicitly advocating carbon capture and storage. And to our delight, other countries have uh, replicated what we did in the UK. So the energy company, uh, electricity in the electricity company in Portugal, made a calculator for Portugal. There is a calculator for Wallonia and uh, in Belgium, and there is also one for, for Flanders. So we've got the whole of Belgium covered. There is a calculator for China, and one for Korea, and there's one for India called the 2047 Energy Security Scenarios uh, Calculator. There's one for Japan, and there's another 10 countries that either have uh, calculators or are making them. And this has happened uh, with a bit of support from the UK government, and mainly with uh, in-house um, government-supported activity in the, the country itself. There is one for the Netherlands as well that, that was uh, done independently of the UK uh, activity. And finally, there is a global calculator as well. The global calculator looks like this. And it has lifestyle levers for the average citizen of the world. It has technology on the demand side, it's got the usual renewables and nuclear and bioenergy levers, and it's got land use and population levers. So everything that people ought to be talking about is in there as something that can be varied, so you can see the consequences of any mix of actions. And here's the emissions rate under a sort of 
business as usual pathway where the emissions rate continues to go up and up. And cumulative emissions shown by the gray bar here um, are absolutely enormous compared with this red line, which is an indication, give or take the unknown climate sensitivity of the two degree limit. So here's a business as usual pathway. Here's another pathway where you take half-hearted action. I think this is going to be the outcome of the Paris uh, talks that are coming up. Maybe the Paris talks will succeed in getting the emissions rate to level out and to stay constant. And that means cumulative emissions are still increasing, so it's not solving climate change, but at least the temperature in 2100 won't be quite so big. And I'd like to just show you something uh, quite striking. This is completely open source, and you can go and play with it, and I encourage you to do so. So we've got all sorts of levers like nuclear. We can crank up nuclear to higher levels and see how much difference that lever makes. And you can grab the renewables if you want. But let's go and play with one of these levers over here. Here's the diet levers. And there's a lever called quantity of meat in your diet. And you can have that quantity of meat go to European level. So the average citizen of the world eats a European amount of meat. Look how much difference that makes. Did you see what that did to cumulative emissions? I'll put it back again to level two huge. And what if we go to level four? This means the average person in 2050 is living like a healthy Indian, uh, consuming much less meat. Look what that does. Now, people don't talk about that very much, do they? <laughs> but I think it's one of the options that should be on the table. The reduction in meat consumption makes a hell of a difference. And if you say, no, 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 thou shalt not tell anyone about eating McDonald's hamburgers, fair enough, put it back where it was, and let's go and play with all the other levers but it's uh, not easy to make the time that adds up. Okay. Question. Yes, question. Is there an intuition as to why that meat lever has such an effect? Yeah, why is meat so important? Great, great question. Meat is important not because of the methane coming out of the cows. It's because of the land use requirement. So to feed the cow that you're going to eat requires an enormous amount of land. If everyone lives like Europeans, then you have to deforest a lot more of the world in order to grow the grain to feed the cows. And one third of all climate change so far has been called, caused by land use change. So one of the big drivers of climate change so far is meat eating, uh, because that, that's what uh, most of the, the agricultural land area is devoted to. Ah, I can see people getting all feisty. Uh, no, no, what about, what about fish instead of meat? What about fish instead of meat? Okay, uh, I don't know an exact answer. Uh, it, it may be in the calculator, let's check. Uh, I, and it's di may be difficult to sustainably source lots of fish, we're not doing a great job of it. But yeah, definitely fish could be okay. Fish might be all right. All right, okay, let's, uh, let's get on to um, the, the last reason why climate change action is difficult. And then when we're really depressed, I'll, I'll tell you uh, something slightly optimistic to finish off with. So, when you use these sort of calculators, like the UK's calculator or the global calculator, what you find is that climate change action requires you to deploy a lot of technologies which are expensive, like building insulation or wind farms or solar or nuclear power. And those technologies are expensive compared to today's fossil fuels. And some of them have front-loaded costs. That means you have to pay a lot up front, and then you get the benefit for decades into the future. Like you're building insulation, you pay now, and then you save loads of money in the future. And both of those uh, features are difficult to get through in today's system where politicians care very much about the next four years or so. So that's depressing, but we uh, can address it with innovation support. So what can we do to make a difference? Well, we could get involved in driving down the costs of low carbon technologies, and we could encourage politicians to put more money into innovation support to drive down the costs of low carbon technologies. So I'd like to just whistle through what I would like for Christmas. Here's examples of the sort of things where if you get the costs down, uh, it really could make a difference. So it would be great to have amazing insulation that doesn't take up so much space in your house or on the outside of your house and cheap methods for fitting that insulation to uh, crappy buildings in cold countries. We need electric vehicles that are cheaper, lighter, um, light weighting of vehicles in general is a, a great idea. We need smart meters that induce the sort of behavior changes I was uh, describing. We need heat pumps that work efficiently, uh, like these, this Japanese heat pump called Pumbu that has cape and gloves, the lot. Uh, we need wind, to, wind power to get cheaper, 
Um, and for countries that don't like having wind farms on the land, we need offshore wind, which, which definitely needs to get cheaper. And uh, this is a prototype 7 megawatt uh, wind turbine uh, developed using digital hydraulic technology. So you get rid of the gearbox, which is a major point of failure in today's wind turbines, and replace it by a digitally controlled hydraulic uh, gearbox that can take much bigger powers and, and doesn't fail. Uh, so that's going to improve the prospects for large-scale uh, offshore wind. And then if we're really thinking outside the box, you could ask the question about a standard wind turbine. Where does most of the power come from? And the answer is actually the tips of the blades. Almost all of the power is being uh, harvested by the tips of the blades. And the tower is obviously not doing any power generation for you, and nor is the foundation. Um, and that's where most of the expense and weight is, making the tower and the foundation. So let's get rid of uh, the foundation of the turbine and the tower and just keep the tip of the blade and use smart engineering to make sure that the tip is in the right place. The reason you have a tower and a foundation in a normal wind turbine is that that's heavy, robust engineering to make the tip of the blade move round and round in circles. But instead of that, we can use a control system. So brilliant engineers, some of them from MIT, have made a control system that will make the tip of a wind turbine blade go round and round in circles. These are 50 successive photos of the tip of a turbine blade, also known as a little aeroplane, going round in circles on the end of a piece of string. So a control system is being used on the fly to make it run round in circles, and then you can put a microturbine on that plane and suck power out of it to, to keep it going around at a steady, steady speed and send that down the piece of string. So that's called Makani Power, it's an example of a kite power company. So there's all sorts of innovations we can, we can make. This innovation will reduce the mass in a wind turbine by a factor of seven or so, so incredibly will reduce the, the cost of making wind turbines by a significant factor. For it to really scale up, you need to make the plane on the end of the piece of string the size of a 747, so it's going to get quite exciting when they do scale this up. <coughs> We need bioenergy that's sustainable. It's very difficult to make a 2050 pathway that adds up but without some bioenergy, even though the land required is, is enormous and the environmental impacts will need uh, to be watched. Uh, we need nuclear power that is uh, accepted by the public, so it's got to be proliferation resistant, safe and low waste footprint. We need carbon capture and storage uh, uh, to work at scale. Carbon capture and storage power stations have come and gone in political popularity in terms of people talking about them, at the moment they're not getting mentioned very much. But if you look at any of the scenarios that the IPCC publishes for successful climate change action, those scenarios involve enormous amounts of carbon capture and storage. The carbon burial rate in those scenarios by the end of this century is about five times as big as today's oil industry. So CCS is absolutely essential to those scenarios and really needs uh, in investment to get it happening and to get its costs down. To deal with the intermittency issues, we're going to need storage solutions, and that uh, may be helped by having smart grids, interconnectors, and uh, lots of ways of storing energy, storing energy as heat, it, using reversible heat pumps, storing energy as hydrogen, or storing energy in phase change heat stores, for example. And in the long run, to get the emissions rate down to zero, which is what you have to do for successful climate change action, we will need vacuum cleaners that suck CO2 out of the sky, because some people will continue using fossil fuels inevitably, and we will need to neutralize that with vacuum cleaners. So we need carbon dioxide removal technologies too. And these are getting very little attention at the moment in, in the political scene. And in addition, if anyone says, oh, why didn't you mention this, that, and the other? Yes, I would like to support this, that, that, and the other as well. So I would like a backup option in case electric vehicles don't turn out as well as I expect them to. So I think it's good to work on hydrogen vehicles and ammonia-powered vehicles, other uh, low-carbon artificial fuels. Uh, making fuels from thin air using CO2 sucked out of the air uh, is probably going to be a useful option to have on the table. And if the climate sensitivity turns out to be on the high side, then maybe society will be interested in the geoengineering where we deliberately reduce the intensity of sunshine hitting the earth to reduce global warming as well. So that's something else I would put money into. And for countries uh, unlike UK and Germany where there's lots of sunshine, the breakthroughs in solar power, power are absolutely crucial and deep geothermal may play a role too. We've reached my last slide. What do we need to take successful climate change action, which I call it a 2050 pathway? Well, we need 
public and political support for a numerate approach. We need people to be talking about numbers and the laws of physics and the realities of engineering. I think a good way to achieve that is to have an energy model that is completely open source for every country and to make that energy model steadily better and better in an open and engaging way. Then we're going to need innovation support to drive down the costs and then to build all the stuff and to do that innovation we need lots of well-trained engineers for getting involved in the training of the next generation of engineers. It's another important thing we can do to make a difference. Thank you very much for listening. people, particularly those in the National Union of Mine Workers, advocate that you can have clean coal-fired stations. Do you think that's realistic? By capturing the CO2 emissions at, at source, as it were. Okay, so the question is, uh, is it possible to have a clean coal-fired power station where you capture the, the emissions at the source? Uh, definitely you can make carbon capture and storage power stations. They're not completely clean. They'll still be putting out some uh, sulfur and some nitrogen oxide pollution probably, and they will be putting out some CO2 because you can't get the CO2 uh, released down to zero, but you can get maybe a 95% reduction compared with a standard coal power station. If you co-fire that coal with sustainably sourced bioenergy, then you can get the overall emissions down, down to zero. As long as it's genuinely sustainable bioenergy, then the bioenergy is acting as a vacuum cleaner, sucking in some CO2. And if you capture 95% of what's going up the chimney, then you can end up with uh, negative emissions. And that's what uh, these IPCC scenarios that I mentioned earlier are imagining. They're imagining that today's coal power stations get turned into bioenergy power stations, uh, sucking CO2 into the plants and then burying that CO2 um, in the ground after you've got a bit of energy out of it. You focused on carbon emission, but uh, what, if we create heat by using energy, doesn't that also contribute to the heating of the earth? Okay, so the, the question is, when we use energy, doesn't that heat the earth uh, too? So that's uh, certainly uh, true. Let's just go back to this map here. So, because we are taking fossil fuels out of the ground and setting fire to them, uh, if you are in Mexico, you are producing power at a rate of 0.1 watts per, per square meter. And that's additional power being generated at the surface. Uh, and you can compare that with the incoming average power of the sunshine in Mexico, which is about 200 watts per square meter. So yes, you're increasing the, the power generation at the surface by incoming sunshine, with your fossil fuel or your nuclear power station from 200 to 200.1 watts per, per square meter. That's the world average. If we do as much as is reasonably possible to um, improve connectivity and also to improve energy storage, and we were to put solar panels in all the reasonable places, does that solve a big chunk of the problem or not? <coughs> okay, so the question is, if we do a long list of things, does that solve the problem? So, yes, there are levers for energy storage that you can crank up, and there are levers for putting lots of solar power stations in deserts, and there are levers for putting huge interconnectors, electricity interconnectors, say, or creating a liquid fuel transport system where you bring artificial fuels from your solar power stations in deserts to the places where people actually live, which is, for the most part, not in deserts. So does that add up? Yes, you can make a plan that, that adds up just fine. So you need an area in the Sahara the size of Germany, and with that area in the Sahara the size of Germany, you can create uh, enough energy to power Northern Europe and North Africa. And you need an area in Texas or Arizona the size of Germany, and you can power North America. Uh, so yes, it's physically possible, but the cost of making that stuff, and especially the cost of the storage and the cost of the transmission systems, and if it is electricity lines that you're talking about, the public resistance 
to the, the pylons uh, is something to bear in mind as well. So yes, there are many ways to make a plan that adds up, but you'll always, if, if, you, if you say, I want to do it with solar and batteries, you're going to be pushing up against some, some real uh, tricky issues, especially on the storage and transmission side of things. If you literally wanted to use allegedly cheap batteries to store energy from the summer into the winter, then that battery is only get, going to get used once a year. And what, what do real batteries cost? Well, if you believe Elon Musk, they cost about $300 per kilowatt hour. Uh, and if you use that battery only 20 times, because it'll have a 20 year life, and if you're using it for interseasonal storage, then you're paying, uh, divided by 20, $15 per kilowatt hour that you've stored in the battery. And today, for fossil fuels, you pay 15 cents per kilowatt hour or less. So it's a factor of 100 too expensive for that to work out. So yes, it's physically possible to buy lots of Elon Musk batteries and store the energy uh, in, into the winter, but it's ridiculous. It's not going to happen. It's 100 times too expensive compared with fossil fuels. So we need absolutely enormous breakthroughs on the storage side of things, far cheaper than an Elon Musk battery. What's your view on tidal energy? Tidal energy? Yeah. Okay, the question is, what's my view on, uh, on tidal energy? Um, I may have mentioned it uh, in my summary of um, powers per unit area of, of renewables. Here we are. So, if you are in a country that has got a tidal resource, like the UK or South Korea or Russia or Canada, then you could make tidal pools and those tidal pools will give you a power per unit area of something like three watts per square meter. And so again, you need country-sized uh, tidal pools to make a really big contribution. And I'm perfectly in favor of that. I'm in favor of any plan that adds up. A beauty of tidal power is it's completely predictable and there's no such thing as a tidal storm. So you don't need the extra resilience that you have to have in, say, a wind turbine to be able to cope with unusual winds. So I love tidal power. And another way of doing tidal power is with underwater windmills. So you take natural places where you have natural tidal pools the size of a country, like the North Sea, and then you suck energy out of the currents, whooshing in and out and round those natural tidal pools. And the power per unit area you can get from those is about 8 watts per square meter. So again, the actual area in the sea that would have to be filled with underwater turbines has to be countrysized uh, again. So I love tidal power. Uh, it needs to get its costs down. The UK has had politicians who've been extremely supportive of tidal power for a long time now and supportive of wave power as well which is also extremely expensive and doesn't work very well so the UK has put a lot of investment into trying to get tidal power and wave power working and my honest feeling is uh, the wave power is never <coughs> going to become cost, comp cost competitive um, even though there's brilliant engineers working on it uh, the tidal power maybe has a chance of getting cost competitive and it's definitely more publicly acceptable than, than the wind, wind power in some parts of the country. Um, does the online <coughs> or any of the calculation take uh, indirect effects into account? So for example, at, at individual level, humans are, human nature is that if you do one thing, one good thing, you compensate by doing a bad thing. But also at the global level, if we take all the energy from a sunny country, where does the sunny country get its energy from? Are you able to, to take that into account? Okay, so the question is, uh, does our calculator take into account the indirect, indirect effects of our actions? So for example, if you save a lot of energy uh, with an energy saving lever, uh, does the tool correctly represent the rebound effect that you'll then actually spend your savings on some additional energy consumption or carbon burning activity? Does it represent the fact that when we import energy from another country, that that country will have to do something? For the UK cal calculator, no. It's a very simple model. It just describes what happens in the UK, and it adds up the energy and emissions for that. It's not an economic model. Uh, economic models can be very misleading. They are, uh, they are often cost-optimizing models that say, oh yes, people will behave rationally and will minimize the, 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 the cost to themselves. And that means the cost-optimizing model takes all sorts of low-hanging fruit. Uh, and in the real world, people don't take those low-hanging fruit. And we thought it was important to make a model that was not an economic model, that was just a sort of facts-based, engineering-based model, so you could see what actually happens if this actually happens. So it doesn't describe um, responses that, that might be predicted. You need to make those judgments yourself when you're using uh, the tool and, and decide whether you think a particular combination is credible. 
the a global calculator uh, definitely does represent the whole world, so it describes energy production for, for everyone. It doesn't explicitly say where the energy is being produced, so these renewable levers are just saying you know, how, how many wind turbines get put up, and the bioenergy levers say how much bioenergy is grown. It's not specifying where uh, in, in the world it is it's grown, so it's, it's determining whether the whole thing adds up or not. There's definitely a lot more to be done in terms of answering your question. You're, you're saying, well, let's drill down and say, who is actually going to produce the energy and how's that going to work and will we be making people starve in the third world because we're growing bioenergy in their countries? That's an extremely important question and we need better open tools to help people understand is that sort of thing implicit in for example, the IPCC scenarios. So let's keep making these tools better so we can really understand what we're talking about. Uh, one last question. Yes. If, if we keep generating all the CO2, when will we be talking about a uh, shortage of storage for it? Okay, the, the question is, if we generate lots of CO2 and if we bury it in the ground, is there a risk we'll run out of storage for the CO2 in the ground? <coughs> Um, the answer to that needs more research to be sure of what the answer is. And the, the research that's needed is you need to spend maybe $20 million a time going to each place where you could bury CO2 in the ground, probably, to do some tests there to see what actually happens when you inject CO2 to confirm what the capacity of each of those geological uh, storage sites is. There's great evidence that you can store chemicals for millions of years in rocks because fossil fuels have done exactly that. Fossil fuels are trapped in uh, uh, rock formations where you have an impermeable cap over a place where fossil fuels were generated and the gas and the oil come up and sit, the cap, sit under the cap and they sit there for millions of years. So there are these sort of pieces of rock that will work but you need to test each one of them to check that it, it will work as, as a store. It's believed, without having done that research, that the, the capacity for storing CO2 is enough to store hundreds of years of, of CO2 uh, emissions. Uh, the biggest place to store it, it is not the existing oil and gas fields, which we know would work, but they're called saline aquifers, and saline aquifers are believed to exist in quantities able to store many, many billions of tons of CO2. Let's thank David again for... Uh